I have a bit of a cold, so if you can, if 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 my voice sounds like it has, like I have a cold, it's because I had a cold. <laughs> um, so why the world needs open access and um, and how to get there? So Nick said this morning we had to focus on the why. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but also about the how, the def different policies that Plan S and Coalition has put into place to 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 actually get there. And I will also talk about collaboration and about equity. Uh, so, why open access? Well, obviously, open access for society makes the research available faster so that others can build on it, uh, accelerates scientific discovery, enhances the return on investment. Uh, for researchers and citizens, of course, researchers' work in open access is much more visible. There's various st studies that have shown that. There is really a real open access advantage. Researchers' work becomes much more visible. There's a read advantage. And of course, since everybody has access, people can also actually verify that citizens can have access to, to research. And there's a potential there to create greater uh, trust in research, which we all need, I believe, uh, because things are verifiable. They're not in this uh, ivory tower behind the, behind the paywall. And uh, open access, I think, is also important for a change in how research is done. It's a part of open science. Uh, it's a first step on the way towards open science, much more open practices, uh, hopefully also things like open peer review, open data that are being practiced, uh, open protocols, code, and so on. So it's about more collaboration and less competition. That's definitely what it's, what, what it's about as well. Uh, so, so these are the whys. I mean, there's probably several other whys, but these are for me the, the, the most important whys. So, um, at the same time, we know that access to scientific research remains a problem. Uh, 20 years after the various declarations on open access, uh, only about 55% of, of research is available open access, which is really ridiculous. Of course, we also know why. I mean, publishers are not really helping, are they? So uh, Plan S then came into being in 2018 as a, a single goal with 10 principles on the basis of this frustration of the funders with... Uh, of funding, funding agencies with the, uh, the way open access was going. So what Plan S basically states is that all scholarly publications have to be uh, from January 2021 onwards uh, published in open access one way or another, whether it is in a repository, in an open access journal, or in uh, uh, and without embargo. So it has to be immediate, full and immediate open access. That's what Plan S says. So, uh, Available in the open access, preferably with the CC BY license or equivalent. And uh, CC BY, for those of you who are not familiar with CC BY, and every day I see people who are not uh, acquainted with CC, CC BY, even among my own authors in uh, the, the journal I publish. CC BY is the most open license, it allows the user to share and adapt the publication. Um, it allows also the author to keep sufficient intellectual rights to reuse their publication and to share it in a repository. Uh, and basically, it's the most academic uh, open license, right? Because it only says uh, you have to credit the original author for their work. But other than that, you can you can transform it, you can change it, you can change it. Um, so, in that sense, it's the most. That's also the license that we went for as coalition, as as, as as a license that an author can assign to their own work. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So Plan S was built on uh, very strong principles, I believe. Uh, open access must be immediate, no embargoes, CC BY license, no hybrid model, very much against hybrid. Right? Hybrid journals, as you know, have part of their materials in, in open access, part behind the paywall. Um, so we were against that unless there was a defined endpoint. Um, pricing contracts and so on have to be transparent. So Oaks also open as in, uh, in uh, for, for services, and the funders commit to paying for these public for publication fees uh, wherever necessary. Individual researchers are not supposed to pay, so the funders uh, of coalition S will pay for open access fees. And also, this is something that has taken uh, a particular meaning, of course, with the development of the Coara Coalition, a coalition for uh, change of uh, research assessment. Uh, principle 10 of Plan S, a, com a commitment to changing research assessment, to no longer assess research on the ba basis of the venue of publications or quantitative metrics or impact factor, but on the basis of in the intrinsic merit of the publication. That's a firm commitment. So that means that when funders assess applications for uh, research, they will no longer look at uh, uh, quantitative metrics or impact factor of the, uh, of the applicant's uh, research record. 
Um, coalition is, is, is an alliance, a global alliance of research funders, uh, 28 organizations worldwide, the collaboration that you talked about. So it's the first time I think that, you know, research funders that together put themselves behind this one goal, a uh, very specific goal, very targeted goal. National funders from Australia to the UK, uh, European Commission is on board with Horizon Europe, uh, charitable foundations from the Wellcome Trust to Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Global Dimension with the World Health Organization. They invest about three, uh, 35 billion euros a year in research with an output of about 150,000 articles per year, uh, which are, of course, which is not that much on a global production of 2 million articles a year, 2 to 3 million articles a year. But of course, these are very prestigious uh, articles, very, well, very visible articles, so it does make a difference. Um, we, did, we also see global alignment. We just recently, there's the memo of uh, 25 August 22, uh, where OSTP recommends that uh, all uh, articles will have to be in immediate open access. They, well, they call it free access, public access, because of course, being Americans, they have to change the word to public access. <laughs> um, and, uh, but there's an interesting twist there. They insist on equitable access. So um, the notion of equitability is something that was not, in, in my view, also not sufficiently taken into account in, 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 in planners. And I think that's a welcome development, of course, um, ensuring free, immediate, and equitable access to federally funded research. So I think those, those words count. Uh, um, this will apply to 400 federal agencies in the US, 150 billion of research funds. So this is, this is real. <laughs> it will make a big difference. Clearly echoes the plan as a goal, of course, although, as I said, being Americans, they want to do this the American way. Um, Plan S itself is not a policy, it's a set of 10 principles, and uh, coalition S funders have basically agreed to implement these 10 principles in a coordinated way and align their policies. That, that, that is what Plan S does. So uh, implementation uh, means that we do not uh, favor any business models. There is, we are neutral with respect to business models, although that might uh, change in the future. Uh, but we do not believe in, the, in a silver bullet approach. Uh, it's a very pragmatic approach to policies, a complementary set of integrated policies, recognizing the complexity of the landscape. And we also seek alignment with other organizations, of course, with university associations, with libraries, with uh, repositories and, and, and other actors in this, in, in this space. So we're also in contact with publishers and publishers' organizations. I mean, you may have seen this week, for instance, we published a journal comparison service which allows uh, uh, librarians and uh, negotiators uh, to, to s compare prices um, of, of the publishers who participate in this journal comparison service. That's something that we did. And we also monitor how this affects uh, young researchers, of course. And we have a global network of Plan S ambassadors. Um, Three routes to compliance. Most of you are, may be familiar with those. The route one is publication in full open access journals. Um, that is compliant, of course. I mean, we, like we said, we support all ways to open access. The ones that you pay for, the ones that you don't pay for. So gold open access journals and diamond open access journals are route one. Uh, route two is publication in subscription journals. That's the most controversial part of our policy with the rights retention strategy. So we ask those authors who want to publish in a subscription journal, they can do so, but then they have to deposit a copy of the author accepted manuscript in a repository at publication. And that's what I'm going to talk most about today. And then route three is uh, publication in journals that are under a transformative arrangement. That is also compliant. So transformative arrangements is something that I'll talk about in a, in a bit. Uh, the librarians among you will certainly be familiar with those. Um, I'll talk about that, those in a minute. Uh, we have also developed the journal checker tool because, of course, for you know an average researcher, these three routes may not be immediately transparent. So we developed this search tool, which basically say, allows a researcher to type in the name of their favorite journal, the name of the university, the name of their funder, and then they get instructions on what they have to do, whether they have to deposit the AAM in a repository with that journal, whether they have to pay a fee, whether the journal is under a transformative arrangement, and therefore they don't have to pay. But there is a, for every journal, there is a clear route towards uh, compliance that is, that is indicated. And since this week now also, the, the, the JCT carries information about whether or not a publisher is participating in a journal comparison service. So those authors who find it important that the publisher provide transparency about pricing will be able to see that in the, the journal comparison tool. 
the journal checker too. So as you can see, this is, these are ways of forcing the publishers to be more transparent and more honest about their, their pricing with us. Uh, transformative arrangements, uh, these are the publishing models, of course, that where a publisher is committed to transitioning the journal to, uh, to, to open access, uh, although exactly how committed they are is often uh, in, in, in question. Uh, these are variously called, um, some are better than others, and this is, of, of course, at the level of library consortia. So library consortia negotiate uh, a contract in which there is not only access to read, but also access to publish. Uh, one of the advantages of, of, of this is that uh, this is very good for researchers who work in such a consortium or work in a library that participates in these consortium because they don't have to think they can publish in these journals for free, so to speak. Right? But um, the disadvantage of these agreements, of course, is that they are relatively local or regional. No? They're national, they're, they're certainly not equitable in the global sense, um, in the sense that every author has, has access to them. This is not true for subscribe to open for reasons that I'll co come back to, but um, some, some of our funders contribute to these um, initiatives. UKRI, for instance, contribute to, uh, contributes to it through their block grants, uh, and so, some others are actively involved in negotiations leading to these agreements. We will stop our support for transformative agreements at the end of 24. Um, because we think, you know, publishers have had enough time to transition their journals to open access. If they can't do it in six years, they will never be able to do it. Uh, and then we'll have to think about alternative solutions. <coughs> At the same time, we have to say that transformative arrangements have led to a large increase of, of open access articles. That's, that's also undeniable. And, but it is also true that transformative arrangements are especially accessible to those library consortia and those countries who can afford to put money into those very lengthy and difficult negotiations. Uh, right? This is not something that is for the faint-hearted or the pecuniary challenged, so to speak. Um, route 2 and rights retention, that's something that should be familiar to you as well. Um, Many researchers do not fully understand that they are the original copyright holders of their articles, uh, but this is something that I insist on almost every day also in my own office. Uh, copyright owner, original author is a copyright owner. If they assign a CC BY license to their work, that has priority over any later uh, copyright uh, agreement. And we believe that very much that open access starts at the source, the author, so if you don't give away your rights, you know, then you have control over, over that article and how it is disseminated. So this is, this is a very important point for us. Um, so um, we want authors who want to publish in the subscription journal to deposit a copy of the AM in a repository. Often authors sign this copyright transfer agreement without really thinking. I mean, you know, uh, authors are more careful about uh, signing a Netflix uh, uh, <laughs> contract then about uh, signing, uh, signing away their rights to the articles that they produce themselves, right? Um, we, we know this, I mean, luckily that's changing, I think, and I think it's, uh, and that's a good thing. But the rights retention strategy basically forces researchers who have a grant to uh, inform the publishers that the prior CC BY license has been agreed on in the contract that they've signed with the funder. So really, it's the, the, the author is under obligation of applying this CC BY license and of informing the publisher that this is the case. And by asserting that, that CC BY license on their paper, authors retain sufficient intellectual <coughs> rights to, uh, re to share that copy in, a, in an open access repository of publication. So that's, that's really important. Um, and uh, the last bullet is important as well, namely, since that CC BY license is in place before the copyright transfer agreement, it has legal precedence over that later copyright uh, transfer agreement, or at least any conflicting clause in that copyright transfer agreement will be null and void as a result of the, C of the earlier CC BY. So CC BY is really powerful. And very often authors will, say, will tell me, well, where do I apply for a CC BY license? I say, there is no place that you apply. You just do it yourself. And they say, really? <laughs> you know, we have a lot of education to do there with our graduate students, with our own, uh, with our own staff. You know, explain to them what CC BY is. Explain to them what copyrights are. Um, because, I mean, this, this, this re requires a change in culture, really. Okay, um, so rights retention strategy is basically based on very simple principle, namely that the author is the original uh, copyright holder, as I said, 
Uh, also, the idea that you know. Uh, Publishers can deliver publishing services, but they don't. They don't have a right to the paper itself. For that, we really want to make a distinction between, let's say, everything content-related that should be the author, also the reviewers in the ownership, and the publishers who can perform services and be paid for those services. It's not. I mean, you know, publishing costs money. I mean, we all agree on that. We want to pay for those services. But in the same way that I, when I invite a painter to my house to paint to paint the house, right? I mean, at the end of the, the painting job, I don't hand over the keys of my house to, uh, to the painter, right? I mean, in the same way, why would you do that if, you know, a nice painting job, a nice editing job has been done with your pa uh, paper? You should, not over, you, should, you should not hand over the, the property rights to that paper. Uh, so, so this is very important for us. Publishers can now have the rights to the version of record. That is uh, something that they often forget when... Uh, when they are against the rights retention strategy. So what authors need to do is basically this. They just need to in insert this statement into uh, every paper they write, namely uh, statement for the purpose of open access, the author has applied the creative com a CC by license to this paper. And often when I talk to authors about it, they can't believe that this is true. They can't believe that it's that simple, right? So we have, again, we have a lot of education to do there. Um, uh, and on the publication, they can then uh, make the AM open access in the repository and contact us if there are any, any problems. Uh, of course, uh, publishers don't like this at all. Uh, <laughs> surprise. Um, and they are knowingly pu uh, putting authors in a difficult situation. Uh, so they will ask uh, the author to sign contracts that contradict the earlier agreement. They will also shunt authors down a path towards paid open access. For instance, that's what Elsevier does. If you uh, claim rights retention with Elsevier, they will say, OK, then you have to go to a gold open access journal. You can't publish in a subscription journal. I'm not sure how long they will be able to sustain that path, but uh, that's what they do right now. Um, and. And some publishers will even be worse. They will wait until the last minute, until the paper is accepted, to then present the author with contract terms that, that contradict their grant agreement, while they, in fact, know full, full well that the author is a coalition as funded researcher. So there's all, all sorts of tricks that they use to confuse researchers. So this is, we think, you know, they have the right to desk reject these articles. That almost never happens. It's very interesting. The publishers don't, but the desk reject the articles. They just make it difficult. It's a guerrilla tactic. They make it difficult for the authors. They confuse, mislead, and trick the authors. We've asked them not to do that. In a, in a letter, we have not re received any answer to our query. <laughs> also, that's no, so surprising. So, um, but in fact, rights retention is receiving broad support. UNESCO declared its support. The G6 declared their support. The EUA, European University Association, is making it part of their policy, representing 850 universities in Europe. And the European Council also uh, insisted on the importance of the retention of sufficient intellectual rights. So we are in good company, <laughs> right? And also we know that universities are adopting uh, rights retention policies. This has started uh, in, uh, with Arctic University of Norway, Edinburgh, Cambridge, Birkbeck. I hear the Leeds University Senate also uh, accepted uh, rights retention. So I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, Aberdeen this week announced their rights return. So it's spreading like wildfire, which is great, I think. Now the rest of Europe. So this is one of those things where the UK can show an example to the rest of Europe. One of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll stop there. I'll stop there. <laughs> no, but come on. I mean, you know, let's look on the, at the positive side here. <laughs> um, but I really think it's, it's, it, this is great. Um, in in um, in Norway as well, of course, and TNU and, uh, and, and uh, Tomsø have, uh, have done this. And other universities will follow. I'm looking at you, uh, Kurt. <laughs> um, um, and there's also, of course, this is, this is why institutional retention po uh, policies are so important, right? Because, I mean, this is much more important uh, because uh, universities have a direct relation towards their researchers, right? We only, as funders, funders only have an indirect relation. They don't have really an employment con contract. But if rights retention become part of a university policy, then this is a, this is a labor condition. 
right, for researchers, right? So tension then becomes a labor condition. And this is much more powerful because of my last, last bullet here, namely it protects researchers against publishers. That's, and that's the important thing. Namely, if CC BY is mandated and a publisher tries to trick an author to drop the CC BY license or to, tries to take it away, which they sometimes do, they delete the CC BY license, although deleting it wouldn't, wouldn't work because it has been declared, I mean, it's, you know. But th then there would be a, a tort of procuring a breach of contract. And <coughs> that is quite serious because basically what you're trying to do, you're trying to make someone break the contract that they have with the university uh, and and that's, that's illegal. So publishers should think twice if they want to go against a university rights retention. So that's why we are so excited that universities and Leeds in particular and other universities in the UK are, are doing this because this is really the way forward. Uh, and this is again an example, I think, of collaboration. Collaboration between funders, because I mean, we sort of started this in Europe and then universities have, have actually have explicitly told us that, you know, because we came with this, they were inspired and they felt inspired to, to do this and to follow suit. And now you see it really spreading and I think this is a great example of collaboration for the, for the, for the greater good. Um, uh, we have also, as I said, launched the price and services transparency. JCS is a secure service. It's not open for all researchers, true, granted, but uh, publishers made it very clear to us that they didn't want to play ball unless we made it a secure service for reasons of competition law uh, are that, that are unclear to me, but that's what they said. So we wanted to start at least something, even if it was only accessible to library consortia. Uh, we hope that it will be uh, opened up a bit more when publishers feel less tense about this in the future. But at least for now, um, this, is, this is a service that we uh, offer library consortia and funders to, uh, to get an insight into the prices publishers are charging. Um, we also uh, are involved in, 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 diamond, uh, in uh, diamond publishing. Diamond, as you know, is free for readers and authors. Uh, it's community owned and led. Those are those journals, like my own journal, journals that do not charge fees to either readers or authors that are uh, led by academics themselves, led by universities, university libraries very often. And, uh, but in fact, what we found with the study is that these, these journals are actually uh, really an archipelago of unconnected islands. Um, so it's really every university, every editor doing their own little journal in their corner without much collaboration. And this is something that we want to change. Um, with the Diamond Action Plan, a plan to develop common resources for these journals, much inspired by what has been done in South America, actually, by Red Alica America and Cielo. And we're trying to do the same for Europe. Um, a plan uh, by this Diamond Action Plan and by various projects that have been, um, uh, two projects that have been financed by the EC, a project, the Yamas project and the Craft Away project that have started now and that will be brought forward uh, where we will try to bring together these Diamond Journals and try to enhance their capacity and um, um, align practices, align governance principles and so, and so on. Uh, and 150 organizations have signed up, uh, up to this uh, Diamond Action Plan, so this is really uh, a, an important uh, event. I think it's really important for us as the academic community, again, in terms of collaboration across uh, countries, global collaboration, to show that we can present an alternative that is more equitable, um, uh, that we can collaboratively do this across the world. Um, to bring these journals together and present them as an alternative to commercial publishing that is much more equitable. I'm comparing the different models. Um, Gold Open Access, of course, being the most inequitable in a, in a sense, right? I mean, it's equitable to read, yes, but it's certainly not equitable to publish. It's, uh, Gold Open Access, higher APC fees are simply not affordable, affordable to countries from the global south. Um, there is no possibility to negotiate prices. It's the same price for everyone. It's, I, as I often say, it's probably one of the only services that has a single price set for the entire world. If you look at anything else, Coca-Cola, aspirin, flight tickets, you know, the prices vary as a function of power purchasing parity. Not so for APCs. I mean, I, I don't understand. Uh, but then again, I'm not a publisher. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an editor, but I'm not a publisher. Um, and uh, yeah, so... Um, 
So there's a number, but, but this something went wrong with this slide. Uh, transformative agreements, of course, are also not, not equitable because they very often anchor a price at a very high level uh, for, the, for countries in the north, as I said, you need capacity for them. Subscribe to open is a, is a bit more equitable because there the, the agreement is that you continue as a library, to, you continue to pay the subscription funds, but in exchange, everybody, wherever they're from, can, can publish open access in that journal. So that, to me, seems like a virtuous model of, of publishing. Of course, very often these journals are not in the hands of the academic community. Sometimes they are, sometimes they are not. But it's a fair model, right? The, the idea there is simply if the journal can garner enough uh, subscriptions to sustain itself at a predefined price paid by the libraries, then in exchange, all the content will become open access and all authors can publish their open access. I think that's, that's fair. Uh, and then, of course, there's Diamond Open Access that scores uh, 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 very well on, on, all, uh, on all aspects of, of equity. Um, finally, I have a last slide on, on, on uh, open access for academic books, because we were often asked, what do you do for academic books? Well, uh, we had the principle there, kicking the ball down the road, saying, you know, timeline to achieve open access has to be longer, we will come with a statement, and we did come with a statement, namely saying that there again, uh, all academic books based on original s uh, research supported by coalitionists should be made open access. Uh, author and institutions should retain sufficient intellectual rights, so that's important. We also recommend a CC license, not a CC by license there necessarily, but a CC license. Uh, and uh, that embargo peri period should not exceed 12 months. Why did we do that? Because uh, basically because UK, UKRI and the EC already had put into place since 2018 a policy that did exactly this. And of course we didn't want to lose the coalition. Also, there is also contentive reasons, namely um, uh, the, the book market is a very different market from the journal, from the journal market. I mean, there's lots of small publishers that uh, still have not realized the importance of, of open access and that need to adapt. And the last thing you want to do, if, of course, especially in social sciences and humanities, is lose those small publishers by too rapid a transition to open access. So we're still there in the open access book market. We need to think about um, sustainability, sustainable systems of moving the market to open access in a way that is, again, not going to cost us an arm and a leg with very high book processing charges. We have to find communal solutions there. And this is something that we will be working towards also in the next few years in combination with the uh, uh, directory of open access books and collaboration with OIPEM and the OA Books Network. There again, there is a project that funded by the EC that will start and that we are also involved in as, as coalition. Okay, I'll, I'll stop here.